Who doesn't love a good story? Well, today on Through the Bible, we're going to sit at Jesus' feet and study several of his stories, or parables, that illustrate important spiritual principles. Dr. J. Vernon McGee will guide us through Matthew chapter 13 today. Now, this chapter is often misunderstood, he says, but it's key to understanding Jesus' message. We'll start our study at verse 44. And while you turn to Matthew 13, Greg and I have a really quick update for you from South Korea. Steve, we have a wonderful ministry there. Pastor Kim is the Dr. McGee to the Korean people, and it's called, they call it Maggie's Bible Study. I've been there, and and they call it Maggie's Bible Study, which I love. And and of course, uh, Korea is a highly developed nation, a tremendous uh, work ethic, a wonderful people. and A lot of Christians. A lot of Christians, very deeply committed, and we get lots of texts. So today we just wanted to share some of those great texts from our Korean ministry. Yep. Here's the first one. It says, Through McGee's Bible study, I learned the Bible is the mirror which shows our sin, and through blood of Christ we are saved. That was very touching. I will continue to tune in with a heart of anticipation. That's a great, there's a, there's a lot packed into that yep, short text. Now, here's is. another one. I love, I love the picture of this one. It is Monday evening, and I am still working. I will tell you. Like the, a good Korean. The Koreans are incredibly hardworking people. Yeah. This person says, I feel exhausted. But as I drive home, McGee's Bible study is like the oasis in the desert, teaching my thirsty soul. I can't wait to study the next one. What an encouragement. Uh, that is so cool. Here's another one. This says, The way to achieve salvation is through faith. This is new to me. Salvation is made possible by the blood of Jesus and his sacrifice. This too is new. Jesus is our Savior who satisfies God's will. I will follow Jesus with humility and appreciation. Thank you for the strong but gentle messages. I believe that faith comes by hearing. I thank God he saves souls using your program, I Am But One. And Steve, you've met Pastor Kim, the the speaker, and yeah. he is a gentle. He is a he's a very gentle presenter, and and I love that. Now, now here's uh, another text that came in from our Korean ministry. Some Sunday messages from my church haven't fed my needs for learning the Bible more deeply. However, McGee's Bible study fills that gap for me. Thank you for giving us the message in a way it is fun and easy to understand. You think he's doing hmm. Dr. McGee? I yeah, think he is. I would yeah. say he is. Here's another one. Today's message has been wonderful and I enjoy listening to McGee's Bible study always. I feel excited to be closer to God. I will follow God. I love this picture. Like a sheep that follows Jesus. (laughs) These are great texts. I mean, usually some of our longer letters have a lot in them, but these these are really rich. Now, here's another one. I feel the love of the Lord when I listen to McGee's Bible study. When my body and mind feel weak, then I have no desire to confront temptation or read God's word. But when I listen to McGee's Bible study, it motivates and comforts me in Christ. Greg, unfortunately, we've got to leave stuff on <laughs> I the know, table. I hate that. Why don't you pray for us as we begin? Father, thank you for the way you're changing lives around the world. We pray you'll change our lives now as we study your word together in Jesus' name. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today, friends, our study brings us back to the 44th verse of the 13th chapter of Matthew. Now we have put down a certain pattern and principle by our Lord interpreted two of these parables for us. And I don't think we'd have any right to depart from his interpretation. And we need to note that as we go through this section here, because we have coming up now three unusual parables that deal with certain aspects of the kingdom of heaven, that is, as it is today. Now, the first one is verse 44, and we merely mentioned it and read the verse last time. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Now, let's stop there for just a moment. The field we already know is the world, and this is not a sinner buying the gospel, because the gospel, for instance, is not hid in a field. What is it that's hid in a field? Well, it's the nation Israel. The field is the world, and that nation is 
buried, actually, in the world today. Somebody says, well, they're a nation right now. They are, but they're sure having a struggle, aren't they? And they'll not be able to really enjoy that land until they get it from the Lord Jesus Christ. I was very much interested in reading a paper that I received from that land, and it was of a convention that they had had there of certain scientists, and I noticed in the picture that there was a great sign in both English and Hebrew above the platform, and it read, Science will give us peace in this land. Well, may I say that science will not give them peace in that land. Only the Prince of Peace can do that. And they are buried as a nation throughout the world. The largest number of the nation Israel are not in that land, but are in New York City, for instance. And they are still scattered throughout the world. But God is not through with them. He says very definitely in the 11th chapter of Romans, Paul wrote, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Now, friends, uh, apparently Paul believed that the Lord is not through with him. And Zechariah, one of the last writers in the Old Testament, makes it clear there's coming a day when he wrote in the 12th chapter, verse 10, I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for me as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. That's a day that's yet to come. And you'll find Jeremiah speaks of the fact that he'll gather them from the east and the north and the south and the west. Now, that time has not come yet. When he gathers them back there, they'll even forget the Passover, that which has been remembered longer than any other religious holiday. God is not through with the nation Israel. And this parable, I think, makes that very clear. How did he do it? Well, he's redeemed them. He bought them with his blood, if you please, just as he bought your salvation and my salvation. And there will be, as Zechariah says, that fountain opened in the house of David. Now, we come to the sixth parable, and that's verse 45. And he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, let me give you the popular interpretation of this. The popular interpretation is the sinner is the merchant man and that the pearl of great price is Christ and that the sinner goes and sells all that he has that he might buy Christ. Well, that's all very good. It's simple enough, but the merchant man is not the sinner. And the pearl is Christ and salvation, you see, according to these. And there's a hymn that has it like this. I have found the pearl of greatest price. My heart doth sing for joy, and sing I must, for Christ is mine. Christ shall my song employ. Well, I can't accept that. I dismiss it as unworthy of thoughtful consideration. Now, to begin with, who is it that's looking for goodly pearl? The sinner's looking for salvation? Not the way I read my Bible, nor have I found it that way as a minister. They're not looking for salvation. The merchant man couldn't be the sinner because he doesn't have anything to pay. To begin with, he's not seeking Christ, and even if he found Christ, what would he pay? He has nothing. He says, those that are without money and without price, come and buy. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money. And this time he sells all that he has. Well, how can a sinner sell that when he's dead in trespasses and sin? Well, granted that even all that's true, which it's not, but granted that's true, that this interpretation is accurate. What about this? 
Christ or salvation is not for sale. It's a gift. God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. The gift of God's eternal life in Christ. Well, somebody says, then what in the world does it mean? Well, a merchant man is Christ. He left home. And he came to this earth from heaven. And he came down to find a pearl of great price. And what did he find? Lost sinners. He died for them. He shed his blood. He sold all that he had. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. And he redeemed us to God. He bought us. Now, let's look at that pearl for just a moment. What is the pearl? Well, the pearl's not a stone like a diamond. It's formed by a living organism, a little sea creature. It has a piece of foreign matter, a little particle of sand intrudes itself into the shell of this little creature, and it hurts and harms it. And the organism responds by sending out an accretion and covers over that stone. It gives off that fluid until a ruby-like and emerald-like thing is formed. Oh, no, a beautiful white pearl, not a ruby or emerald. And you don't cut a pearl. A pearl is intact. The minute you cut it, you ruin it. But you can cut a ruby or an emerald. And actually, the pearl was never considered very valuable by the Israelite. You will find that in several passages why you get that impression. Probably I ought to turn to one of those, and it would be over in the 28th chapter of the book of Job. Let me turn there, read verse 12. But where shall wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? And then verse 16 says, It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. And then he says, listen to this, No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. And in other words, pearls and coral are put together. It wasn't considered valuable among the Hebrews, but it was very valuable to the Gentiles. And so when Christ mentioned goodly pearls, why, his apostles wondered. People gave to the pearl a symbolic meaning of innocence and purity, that it was fit only for kings and potentates. And now with this information in our thinking, what about a pearl? Look at the parable. Christ came to this earth. He was the merchant man. He saw man in sin, and he took man's sin and bore it. Sin intruded upon him. It was that foreign matter, and he was made sin for us. And someone has put it like this, I got into the heart of Christ by a spear wound. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And what was his response? Well, he put around the sinner that trusts him his white robe of righteousness, and he formed the church. And the pearl is the response of the organism. My sin was the foreign object. He made me white. Impurity is made pure. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Christ saw what he could make out of us, not what we were. Christ sees his church as she will be someday presented to him without spot and without blemish. And he sold all that he had in order that he might gain the church. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And what do you find when you go over to the book of Revelation? I'll not take time to go over there right now. But you find that new Jerusalem, that's the home of the church. And what is the emblem on the outside of that city? The gates are made of what? Of pearl. That's no accident, friend. May I say to you, he is the merchant man. And he's the one that paid all that he had for your redemption and mine, that he might make the church one body presented to him. And it's different from any other very precious jewel. Now, will you notice the seventh and the last parable in this series? Verse 47, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net 
that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to show up, sat down, gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end, not of the world, the Bible doesn't teach the end of this world. Time will be no more, but eternity begins. And as far as I'm concerned, I can't tell the difference. My friend, I've never met anybody else that could, but it means there's no end to it, whatever it is. So shall it be at the end of the age, it's ion. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. And that's the end of the age when he comes to establish his kingdom, by the way. And he shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Our Lord makes it clear in this section that it's a terrible thing to be lost. I was very much interested in reading a scientific paper by men that were presenting certain evidence in several different fields. And the point was they were not sure exactly what the atom blast would do. They were not sure whether germ warfare would do this. They were not sure what the effect of the pill. There were many things. And then one of the scientists said this. He said, it's just like this matter of eternity today. He said, you may not know whether there's a heaven or hell, but you better make sure that you're going to heaven because even if you happen to be wrong, you'll be right. And if you're wrong, it's sure going to be bad. My friend, it is. And our Lord made it very clear it's going to be very bad, by the way. It's very sophisticated today. You'll be a very suave person. You will not be a square if you deny that there's such a thing as hell. But my brother, my sister, you don't know a thing in the world about it, really, do you? You say, well, you don't either. Only what's in this book. And since this book has been so accurate, and in my own life, I've proven it true, I take it for granted that this is accurate. And I work on that premise. And I think it's more than a premise. Uh, my friend, if you were told a hurricane was going to hit your town, wherever you are, what would you do? Well, if you were given the information, why, you might have somebody come along and say, they said that 10 years ago and no hurricane came. And you could say, well, they might have been wrong 10 years ago, but they could be right this time. I think I'll go to a storm cellar. You'd be a fool if you didn't. What about the man that says, I'll take my chance be too bad if you're wrong, brother. Our Lord is making that clear in this section here. Now, in verse 52, we come to something that is very important again. There are those that even call this a parable. Maybe it is. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that's a householder. And I take it this is a parable which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. And that is very personal, so personal that I feel like this is sort of my business. I'm to bring forth things both new and old. When somebody says to me, well, we've heard all that before. Sure you have, but that's my business, to bring forth things old, but I do hope we get in a few new things. And that's what we're to do today. Bring forth from the word of God things both new and old. Verse 53, it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was coming to his own country, that's up in the north, he taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Now, they never question whether he performed miracles. I want to make that clear, that in Christ's day, they never questioned it. The thing they question is, how does he do it? Verse 55, is not this the carpenter's son? And that's what confused him. They did not recognize really who he was. To them, he was just the carpenter's son. And that's all he is to some folk today. Yes, he's a great teacher. He was a great man, wonderful person. But to me, he's just a carpenter's son. That's what many are saying. My friend, he still asks the question, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And we're going to hear him ask that question before too long. 
Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, his brethren James and Joes and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? You see, he had brothers and sisters. They actually were half-brothers and sisters to him. They did not understand him. They were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And that is the thing that, of course, deceives a great many people. You don't get too familiar with him. I'm afraid a great many did in that day. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, this is a tremendous statement. What was it that limited the power of God when he was here? was unbelief. It wasn't that he wasn't able to do it. And friends, the problem with you and with me is that we do not have faith. And now I'm talking about faith for the salvation of men and women. We need that kind of faith today. They believe that he can do it. And he's limited today in your community and your church, in your family, and in your own life by unbelief. And that is certainly true of me also. This is a great truth here. Now that brings us to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And we see now the continuance of not only this rejection of him, but actually we see here that there is this antagonism building up and this movement in Matthew of the rejection of Jesus as king and his conflict with the religious rulers not only continues, but builds up and pyramids. This chapter reveals that events are moving to a crisis, and the slaying of John the Baptist, as we shall see in this chapter on the pretext that Herod must keep his oath, is an overt act of antagonism toward light and right, which must ultimately lay wicked hands on Jesus. Jesus withdrew in order not to force the wicked hand of Herod, for the hour of Jesus had not yet come. Now, we also will come to the feeding of the 5,000. It's an important miracle. All four gospel writers record this, and this is the only one that they do. We have now in chapter 14 the murder of John the Baptist. Let me begin reading. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus, and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Somebody says, That sure sounds superstitious. My friend, it is superstitious, but it's not the superstition of the Bible, nor is it the superstition of Jesus, nor is it the superstition of his apostles, nor is it the superstition of Christianity. It's the superstition of old Herod and the superstition, actually, of ignorant men and women of that day and of this day. Just think of the number of people that go to the five and ten cent store, and I haven't found out anything there you can still buy for five cents, but go to the store and get a horoscope and actually follow it. A great many people do that today. Well, that's the same thing existed in that day. Now, no real Christian would believe that type of thing, of course. You see, the ministry and the person of the Lord Jesus could not escape the notice of the king on the throne. And Herod, and I've recommended this before, you ought to look that up in a good Bible dictionary, and you'll find out that Herod family say they're a bunch of rascals and of the very darkest hue. You can talk about the mafia. They were the mafia of the first century. And this Herod is no exception. And he was superstitious. He had a bad conscience. He put John the Baptist to death. And believe me, he's disturbed about it. Now, we're going to have to reserve until next time to consider this and the incidents again of a very interesting chapter. But Actually, I do not feel like it's as significant as chapter 13. Be sure and get our notes and outlines if you do not have them. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Dr. McGee's notes and outlines are available for free when you download our digital book, Briefing the Bible, at ttb.org 
or we can mail you an abbreviated paperback copy when you call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. So, here's a pop quiz for you. Which of Jesus' miracles is recorded in all four Gospels? Well, join us on the Bible bus on Monday and see if you're right. I'm Steve Schwetz. For all of us at Through the Bible, we're praying that God blesses you today as you walk with Him. Jesus made it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.